Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guests today are Bill Conley and Bob Massa from Enrollment Intelligence Now. Our listeners may remember Bill from a previous show where we discussed the enrollment cliff. And since his retiring from Bucknell University, he has partnered with his longtime friend Bob Massa, former VP of Enrollment at Johns Hopkins, to assist universities in overcoming their enrollment challenges, especially at how things have changed in the COVID era and what institutions must be thinking about to ensure their enrollment meets their goals and needs going forward. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you both on here. Bill, you're a returning guest. Bob, first time. Looking forward to uh, a great conversation around enrollment management. Right now, COVID is, of course, the big thing. Recruiting numbers have come out for fall term, and they're not looking real good. Uh, There's a few colleges and universities who have done well, but by and large, enrollment's down 5%. What's going on? What's changed? Well, I think uh, you you said it, you know, COVID has changed all of us. Enrollment is is down uh, overall by the National Center of Education Statistics, about 2.5%, but it's very different in different sectors. For example, private four-year colleges down about 4%. International student enrollment is around 11% down. Uh, we can clearly understand why international student enrollment is down. Uh, is it difficult to get into the United States, number one? And number two, COVID has restricted travel. And the same with domestic students. Uh, students are attending institutions that are closer to home. And not a huge number, but a not insignificant number have deferred their admission uh, to uh, to next year. Uh, interestingly enough, community college enrollment is also down. Uh, I, I had thought that would be up uh, as a result, but uh, I think the only ones who have done uh, relatively well in this are the regional publics. Uh, they're not down quite as much. Yeah. Well, even even so, they're down as well. And with their enrollment going down, plus the budgetary hits from the states, that's going to create turmoil at the publics. I I think um, absolutely. And to add to Bob's very accurate summation of this current fall 2020 enrollment, remember a year ago, more than 50% of four-year colleges and universities had not met their enrollment goal. COVID-19 has put a sharp punctuation on a trend that for many sectors of higher education and particularly small four-year liberal arts colleges that are highly dependent on a regional enrollments in regions where high school graduation rates are declining and will decline more precipitously. So yes, this is a COVID-19 effect, but it's one that is building on a trend that has been going for the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And Bill, you and I, when you were on the podcast last time, we talked about the enrollment cliff. And I think that's what you're you're referring to is the number of college age students is going to be de- decreasing significantly. Correct. And um, Nathan Graw, the, the economy uh, economics professor from Carleton, um, who wrote Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education, he pointed to the 2008 2009 Great Recession in which fertility rates dropped significantly. And he laid over what was already a pretty discouraging picture of high school graduation rates in 2030. And it's actually going to be much worse when you add that fertility decline. So again, now we're looking at perhaps an environment where families will have another wave that won't hit until 2040. But we are in for a very rough ride. As, as we used to say, it's going to be Mr. Toad's wild ride. Mm-hmm. And so we're talking really current, but we're also talking future. It's like we said before, the finite versus the infinite game. 
the strategic versus the tactical. And decisions that are being made right now are going to affect an institution, not only right now, but five, 10, even 20 years into the future. Yeah, I think there's there's a real tendency on the part of, of enrollment managers and, and, and probably uh, college presidents and provosts as well to focus on the here and now uh, because the crisis is right in front of us. I certainly understand why leaders do that. I mean, I've done that. But I think what we have at stake here, particularly with the enrollment cliff coming in several years, uh, is decisions that we make today are going to have an impact far into the future. This is a lot easier said than done. Mm-hmm. So, and I can can sit here and, and uh, kind of pontificate about this stuff, but it's it's much more difficult to implement it, but really, really critical for uh, leaders in higher education and in other sectors as well, but particularly uh, in higher education to look toward the future in terms of the impact that the decisions that they are making now will have. Because if they're at the helm or if their successors are at the helm, uh, what's being done today is definitely going to impact the future. Give me a few examples of those, if you would. Bill, did you want to? Yeah, I, I was going to say that I think what Bob uh, framed is this tension between the here and now decisions that you know might keep the lights on, so to speak, but making sure that they don't inhibit or divert your your longer term opportunities and excellence. But what happens in this environment is the sense of trust that decisions in some cases are being made, not unilaterally, but they, they're being made in some more efficient manner that for higher education is foreign to them. That's a corporate sector. That's the corporate sector that says last quarter sales were down 60%. We've got to change that for the second quarter, right? And you don't go to the board, you don't go, you, you make the changes. So I think for the colleges and universities who are successful in balancing the here and now with the future have to concurrently build trust within their college and university across what I would call the university governance structure. Faculty, staff, board of trustees, because they're going to be trade-offs you know, to kind of make those decisions. So I think that's the fundamental building block for being an effective leader is how you build the trust at a time where you need to be making critical decisions in a relatively short period of time. I want to come back to that thought um, in a second, but I, but I want, because it's a critical one and really a foundational one, but I want to give you an example, Drum. You, you had asked um, an example of the here and now versus uh, long term. Uh, years ago, probably in the early 2000s, a very well-respected college president of a top liberal arts college in this country made the decision to hold tuition constant uh, for one year. In other words, not to increase tuition uh, because they really didn't have to. They had a large endowment. Uh, they, they weren't hurting for students, but they just thought, look, we don't have to increase tuition, so we won't do it. In retrospect, years later, he said that was probably the worst decision he made because it had a multiplying effect on the institution's bottom line, on its ability to do what it purports to do in terms of its mission. And, you know, as I'm fond of saying, if you don't, no margin, no mission, right? Uh, so if you don't have the funds, uh, you really can't fulfill what you're trying to do. That's one example. And today, colleges uh, were rushing, really, to discount tuition for online learning. Uh, you know, I've taken a, a pretty strong position on that, and I've written you know, several op-eds on it in Inside Higher Ed and other places. The conversation is another um, venue that I, I voice that opinion that colleges really ought not to be. Uh, lowering their price. And the reason for that is that it sets you up in the future, not only to uh, have less revenue than you need, but the expectation on the part of your constituency and the part of your students and their parents is that you're going to continue that lower price. Now, I believe me, I'm all for cost containment in higher education, but price and costs are two different things. Mm-hmm. Um, price is what we charge 
which in higher education is related to cost, but it's not the same as cost. Cost is what, what we pay out to provide that service, that educational service. And typically, it costs more than our price. In other words, our price rarely covers the full cost, uh, the rest of it being made up by endowment earnings, gifts, public assistance from states uh, in the public institutions, uh, federal aid, things like that. So I, I am in favor, obviously, of cost containment, but we have to be very careful about what we do with our price. And that cost containment is so critical in higher ed right now, and we're starting to see some major shifts in that, which goes to what you were saying, Bill, about the decision-making. Uh, higher ed has always been very collaborative, but in times of crisis, collaborative decision-making doesn't work as well when you've got to turn on a dime to get things done. I know of one institution right. who did price rollbacks and it was rolled out very mm -hmm. poorly. And some people, they were eligible for it. Some of them were not. They would have been better off from a strategic perspective, leaving the price where it was and upping their discount rate, which nobody likes to say we have a discount rate of X, Y, Z, you know, 60, 70%. But sometimes that is a better way of doing it from a public perception perspective. Yep, that's right. I believe that. Bill, you brought up a good point on the trust, the governance, whatnot. We're seeing a lot of challenges right now, especially in the decision-making arena with faculty votes of no confidence. Uh, you know, seen three in the last two weeks where faculty feel like they have been excluded from decisions that they felt like they had a right to. That's certainly difficult. How do you go about building the trust with enrollment? Because it's critical that you've got everyone, all your processes in alignment. It's that your people are attuned to a shared vision. How do you go about doing that as a university president? Well, it was interesting um, today, Inside Higher Education had an article about the significant increase, so it seems, in presidents announcing that they are, you know, retiring, resigning, moving back to the faculty, and some surmise that this was a pent-up decision in that in March, they were ready to make the decision, but stayed in to help their institutions through the, the COVID-19 planning. And it's a little bit of a chicken and egg uh, drum in the sense of are these no confidence you know votes ones in which it's really related to their immediate decision making regarding covid-19 or people are cherry picking past grievances and saying yeah well, he did that and she also did that 2 years ago and there's a pattern here i think that moving forward uh, not that we should give leadership, presidents, provosts, or the trustees a free ticket. We do need to hold them accountable. But I think there needs to be a, an understanding that this is, an, it's always been a complex job. And it is even more so. And I think about the great play Hamilton and one of the most popular songs being In the Room Where It Happened. And there are a lot of people on campuses who believe that if they weren't on the Zoom where it happened, the decision was one that was going to cut against them. That's a fundamental distrust versus universities exist not to employ people, staff, faculty, or whomever. They exist to educate students. and. Many of these decisions are about how do we keep our demand in place for our reason for being, which is enrolled students, as Bob described. So I, I'd love us to see if we could go back to the foundations of a university, that we're here for the students. And if we don't have students, we don't have revenue. And if we don't have revenue, we don't have a mission. Maybe it's just going really back to the basics and saying, folks, let's put all this documented governance stuff aside for now, and let's come to a common agreement. What is our guiding principle? 
Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that applies equally to our relationship with students and their parents, uh, who all too often have felt blindsided this year by university decisions to open, to not open, to quarantine. You know, Bill and I have been doing this for a long, long time. Between us, we have 85 years of experience in college admissions and enrollment. I got to tell you, I've never seen anything quite like this in terms of the challenges that it poses, not only for our colleagues, but for students and their parents as well. And so, um, look, it, no one is going, none of our constituencies will like all of our decisions all of the time, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's a given. But, but at least we've got to be open. We've got to convey that we are listening, that we are cognizant of the concerns that our students and parents have and that our faculty and staff have as well, and that we keep them informed. I mean, that's really all we can do. There will, there will still be folks out there who are disgruntled and who are you know, not uh, happy with the decisions that we make. But the more we can be transparent, I know that word is overused, but the, the more we can let folks know what we're doing and why we're doing it, the smoother it will become over, over time. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Uh, it's not a panacea, and it, it's not sufficient to do that, but it, it is definitely necessary. Well, I remember years ago, the National Education Association, the Teachers Union, K-12, came out with a statement that to me was just completely damning. They said, we are here for the faculty to make sure that the faculty get higher pay raises. And there was nothing in that about we're here for the students to make sure the students get educated. Right. That's one of those things that if you have truly have a shared vision, your shared vision should be about making sure students get educated. And you also have to take care of your people as well, but it can't be one or the other. It's got to be both. Right. And I think one of the you led in um, to this podcast with enrollment management, and it, it's worthwhile just to backtrack and s remind people what is enrollment management. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, cynical views of it, that it's about net tuition revenue. And actually, it is. But the best way to maintain and enhance your net tuition revenue is not just recruiting the first time freshmen and the qualified transfers, but it's retaining the students you work so hard to recruit in the first place. And that in the models that Bob and I have worked in, we were, so to speak, cradle to grave. It was the recruitment, it was the admission, it was the financial aid packages, it was finding out how are they doing? What's our, our retention rate? first to second year. And if it's not good, what are we going to do about it? What's our graduation, four and six year graduation rate? What is the giving rate once they've graduated? That's the purview of enrollment management. And quite honestly, not to kind of puff our role up or now that we're both retired, our colleagues doing this in real time. But frankly, it is the best avenue for a university or college to manage the current stresses is to take the reason we're here, which is the student, and on each point along this continuum, how do we do even better? You know, it's not 100% is not good enough anymore. People have to overperform in all of these ways and one thing I, I, as Bob knows, I like to drop in quotes, but Peter Drucker's quote, which was, the best way to plan for the future is to plan the future. And when we talk about trust, it's university governance and saying, we are planning our future here. We're not going to let random future unfold. And we've got to do it together and we've got to follow a core principle students. One of my favorite quotes from Drucker is, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And that goes right to the heart of what we've been talking about, the trust and the transparency. Unless you have a culture that has learned how to trust, and trust is a learned behavior. It's not something that we just naturally have. 
unless you have got the leadership chops to build that kind of trust, it's going to be an uphill battle. Right. One of the things that you touched on, Bill, I'd like to kind of go back to that cradle to grave. One of the things that I recently read about it is today's student, 60% of them are taking advantage of counseling services. It's far greater than it ever was. And to me, that puts a much higher emphasis and need for advising, student advising, student mental health. Is that something that you guys are seeing as well? And if so, what do university presidents, what should they be doing about it? Yeah, well, there's no, no doubt about it. In fact, I, I was uh, thinking of that as Bill was, was speaking as well. The people inside of colleges and universities are very good at building silos. And one of the things that we try to do in enrollment management is break down those silos. Everybody doesn't have to report to us. You know, the counseling center doesn't have to report to us, but we darn well better be in communication with them. So when Bill was saying, you know, we're, we're checking up on how these students are doing, I mean, both he and I at different times have chaired retention committees on which, you know, counselors served. You know, the career center is another important element in all of this. You know, are we working in the same direction to provide internship opportunities and opportunities for our students to network so that when they are at the cusp of graduation, are they uh, going to be employed or in graduate school because of what we, and I say that, you know, the royal we have been able to do. In terms of, of mental health, clearly our counseling centers have been understaffed uh, for this swell, and it happens. Quite frankly, it's happened over time. It's not, it was at a certain level and then all of a sudden COVID came and it jumped up. Uh, it's, it's been climbing. Uh, the rate of students, and I don't have the statistics, but I, but I do know that the rate of students seeking counseling on campus has increased significantly. Uh, and every college president, provost and VP listening to this knows that. I think the, the bottom line for me is that even though we're in a retrenchment period because our revenue has taken a big hit and our expenses, particularly with COVID, has, have increased significantly and we're going to cut and we're going to furlough. We have to make sure that we give leaders, enrollment managers, head of counseling centers, student affairs, the resources that they need to take care of the students under our charge, uh, and to make sure that we not only recruit them well, and that there's a right fit there, but that they go through to graduation. If we don't have the human resources to do that, cutting staff is popular, and I get it, I understand, but we can't deliver unless we have the relationship building capacity through the staff that, uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. One of the creative dynamics on a college campus is between enrollment management and the business office, okay? The business office finance, their view of things like Bob just described, th that's spending money. We're spending money that we don't have or we're spending too much money. And sometimes that's a good analysis. But what Bob just touched on is framing it as investing. This is a spend that we're investing because these students are here. It's not will they show up, they're here. And investing in them so that they can move through all of these different stages of success is a benefit financially to the institution. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, frankly, investing more in financial aid as in increasing the resources, and they have to come from somewhere, maybe increase your spend rate out of endowment, or you do some other cost savings. But that's an investment because that helps you enroll students and helps you keep them. So I think we, we need to have another fundamental principle, which is, can we always look at whether this is an investment or is it truly a spend? It really goes back to that old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You have to be investing in people because when you have a student comes through the door, yeah, they're paying tuition and everything else, but the amount of money that student will bring to the institution through gifts in their later years, donations, development, all of those yep. things, the number of 
folks that they will recruit. Hey, I loved my experience at Bucknell. Right. You should be sending your kids there or, or whatever, you know, yeah, that's an investment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wish we had more time, but we are coming up to the end. Three takeaways from you gentlemen that you would say to university presidents on how to navigate these times with an eye toward the future. My first one, and again, I'll, I'll do my quote thing, but Eleanor Roosevelt said, be confident, not certain. Be confident, not certain. So I think now as a leader is a time to stand with confidence, but given all of the unknowns, it is folly to, to come across as being certain. So I, I think that's, you know, the first one is if people really want a leader who, as Bob said earlier, tells them the truth, good and bad, lays out the options, but does so with confidence, but never with, and I can tell you right now, this is going to work. Nobody can do that. I'm going to interject just a second here. Confidence and compassion. Fair enough. Eleanor would have, if she had more time, she would have added that. <laughs> <laughs> And that, and that goes very, very clearly to what we were talking about in terms of building trust, yes. right? That is, that's a, a number one takeaway. Another for me would, would be making uh, certain to the extent possible that the decisions you make today are going to be made with an eye toward the future, not just expedient what we need to do today, uh, but uh, what are the long-term implications of that? And that requires you know, careful thought, I don't have a quote for you. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but sitting down with your leaders, with your you know fellow wizards, so to speak, and mapping out the implications, the possible implications that uh, a particular decision uh, would have toward the future. That would be one of my takeaways. Great, uh, and I, I would say on a um, this will come across more as basic block and tackling, but you mentioned earlier from the K through 12. And Bob mentioned, you know, the, we, we build silos. There's this bunker mentality. I think presidents need to communicate to enrollment management leaders and their admissions deans to stay connected with the external world, not to be, you know, consumed by our own internal issues to stay in touch with the K through 12 world, to be engaged in your local schools and ways in which you can help. That goes to trust and credibility. This is not a time to pull into the tent. It's a time for the key people who don't have that external outward facing, um, and that includes development. You know, Many of them are frustrated because they can't make house calls, right? But this external facing, that can be something that people forget about under the stress of how are we going to keep this place open and running? Uh, and then you forget about the outside. Mm -hmm. And if I could just add, I know that you said three, but just, just a, a fourth one here. And we just talked about it, investment versus expenditure. We simply cannot expect that our staff is going to produce if we don't give them the resources to do that. They have to be held accountable. They have to be, they have to optimize their work. They have to all be rowing in the same direction. Um, but we can't expect them to meet their enrollment goals or other goals uh, without giving them the resources to do that. Those are great takeaways for your presidents. So gentlemen, what's next? You guys just, uh, you've known each other for a number of years. You've been in this business a long time. You just retired, Bill, you from Bucknell, and Bob, you've been retired a couple of years now. You started the firm in Roman Intelligence now. What's next? Well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Bill, Bill and I um, uh, started the, the firm. Actually, um, we conceived of it over a year ago, but uh, we started this past summer. Our main service, so to speak, is to work with new deans of admission and enrollment, new vice presidents for enrollment, uh, who may have the knowledge about enrollment management, uh, but, uh, but may not have some of the soft skills that will uh, help them to achieve their institutional objectives and, and to be successful. We're doing a bunch of other things too. We, we work together on a nonprofit uh, called the Character Collaborative, uh, which is a group of uh, about 75 schools and colleges that are committed to 
uh, using attributes of character to assess candidates for admission, and a few other things too. Bill? Yeah, and I was going to say, given your audience of college presidents, you know, our, we don't sell software, we, we don't sell solutions, so to speak. What we think we do is provide intelligence. And so while we do some, co we have coaching contracts over a half year, full year, we also do discrete engagements where a president might have, you know, an issue du jour that really a second opinion, a third opinion, another way of looking at it. Uh, we talked earlier about the increasing turnover in, in presidencies, but we also see a big uh, grain, we're examples of this in the enrollment management area, as Bob indicated. There are more and more, we've talked with a number of executive search firms who are saying they are hiring new deans and VPs who might have less experience than their counterparts 10 years ago. So what we want to be is available to folks as needed to kind of just help with these transitions. So it's, it's good work, it's fun work, and um, frankly, it's not work at all. <laughs> well, yeah, you're, you're still able to give back, which knowing you two gentlemen, that's one of your core beliefs is being able to give back. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Drum, appreciate so, it. Thanks for having us, Drum. It's been oh, it's been, it's been great to have you, and we'll, uh, we'll check in with you in another six months, see how things are going. Terrific. Look forward to it. Thanks for listening this week. And a special thank you to this week's special guests, Bill Conley and Bob Massa from Enrollment Intelligence Now, and for their sharing their thoughts on how enrollment is changing as a result of the COVID pandemic. Our next guest is Bill Coletti, president of Kith. Bill has advised Fortune 500 political campaigns and multiple higher education institutions on crisis communications and reputation management and he'll be joining us to discuss how colleges and universities can improve their communications in times of crisis and overall. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.